Welcome. <laughs> so unfortunately, Will is not able to join us tonight. And the good news is that he received his second vaccine shot yesterday. So hooray for that. The bad news is unfortunately he is feeling the after effects. So we will all wish him a good night's sleep tonight and a speedy recovery. And I know he's very disappointed to miss tonight's class, but I will do my best to shepherd us along this evening. Thank you. So we wanted to start with a quick check-in just to see how everyone is doing. And I'm actually gonna share a link to a live poll we're gonna do just to have a little check-in. Um, Jordan, can you share that in the chat, please? Thank you. So how are you doing? Feeling rejuvenated now that spring has sprung? Zoom fatigue in full force, looking forward to spring break or some combination of all of the above. And if you're feeling something else, go ahead and throw that in the chat. I know I'm personally experiencing some disbelief that the semester is almost over. Just a few weeks left. Looks like some combination, definitely some Zoom fatigue, which I hear you. But hopefully tonight, tonight's going to be interactive and some really great conversation. So hopefully that'll energize some of that Zoom fatigue a bit. Cool. We'll leave this open a bit longer. Ooh, Zoom fatigue catching up with combination. All right, looking forward to summer break, definitely. Cool. We'll stop that. And so tonight we have some incredible speakers. Before we dive into that, wanted to revisit the pattern recognition exercise that we all collaborated on together last week. So looking at these top characteristics of change makers, I was looking back over this word cloud and there are a few things that stuck out to me. So this big passionate passion front and center, having a vision, fostering community. And when I'm looking at all of these traits together, I kind of picture this inspiring visionary you know, like a leader who motivates others with this big ambitious dream, thinking about speakers we've had like Dolores Huerta and Jocelyn and Sita, Vincent and Lewis. And I think that's definitely part of what makes a change maker. But looking at some of the other words that pop up in this cloud, I think we've also seen from our guests that being a change maker requires grit and bravery and resilience and that's because it's hard, right? It's, it's not easy to question the status quo. I think we saw that in the guests that I just mentioned, and definitely that was evident from what we learned from Tiffany Patton and Shakira Simley and Liz Carlisle. And tonight we have four more amazing change makers joining us who I think embody these traits and that kind of duality of the pragmatic visionary. So someone who can inspire with an ambitious dream, but at the same time be driven to work tenaciously to overcome the inevitable obstacles. So before we invite Caleb and our panel of entrepreneurs to share their stories, we wanted to encourage some discussion and reflection on this with a breakout room. So our prompt is what are the biggest barriers to entry for people who want to start food businesses? And how can the change maker characteristics that we've identified help entrepreneurs overcome those obstacles? And before we break out, 
We also wanted to just share a quick reminder on our Zoom norms and particularly breakout room norms. So cameras on, please unmute and participate actively by listening and contributing in equal parts. It's definitely a lot more fun when you're talking to other faces and people and not just squares. So here's that prompt again. And when we come back, we would really love to see some of what you discussed in the chat. So please chat with your group and then share some of those takeaways when we come back and we'll break out for five minutes. All right, welcome back. So we'd love to see what you all discussed. If you can share in the chat, or some of the barriers that you talked about and how the characteristics of change makers can help overcome those obstacles. Definitely access to capital, cost, high cost. Seeing mentorship as a way to potentially, potentially that could be a barrier, but also a way to overcome some challenges. Connections, competition. This is really great. Keep this coming. I think there'll be really good opportunities to dig deeper on some of these in the panel conversation and Q&A coming later. Awesome. Thank you guys. Great. Well, now it is my pleasure to bring one of my teaching teammates in to introduce tonight's guests. For those of you who do not know Pooja, she is a first year MBA at Haas and a leader in the Haas food community. And she's done a stellar job coordinating tonight including facilitating those snack boxes that I'm hoping some of you were able to procure. So I'll hand it off to Pooja to join us to help introduce our special guest for tonight. Thanks, Eva. Um, hope, hope everyone was able to get in on those snack boxes or at least a significant number of you. Um, the La Cucina team has been wonderful to work with, and I'm so excited uh, that so many of them are, are able to join us today. Um, we will, our class is going to be structured into two sections today. We'll start off with a panel with Caleb Zegas and, and a few of the La Cucina entrepreneurs. And after that, we'll have some time with Caleb um, alone. So for the, the first part, just want to kick it off by, by giving some, some context about Caleb. He is the executive director of La Cucina which is a social incubator that has been allowing the transformation of people with low incomes, primarily immigrants and African-American women and other women of color into owners of their own businesses in San Francisco. This has translated into 30 micro businesses and support for around 90 businesses in total so far. Caleb overall is a great champion for the inclusivity of women of color in the restaurant industry. And his efforts through La Cucina have also helped a bunch of young entrepreneurs in need of training and infrastructure to accelerate their projects. They've also organized a lot of events such as the San Francisco Street Food Festival that hosted 8,000 people in 2017. And they've most recently kicked off um, the first all female food hall in the United States. So that'll be something that we look forward to, to learning more about soon. Um, as Caleb speaks with the entrepreneurs, um, we would invite you to put any questions that you have in the chat. And um, after the, the panel, we'll, we'll get to some of those questions. Uh, just a reminder, we will have time later um, with Caleb one-on-one -on -one, um, or one on 200, however many of us there are. Um, <laughs> so um, let's, let's stick to questions for the entrepreneurs at the beginning, and then we'll have uh, time for questions for Caleb, um, including some, some wonderful um, TV and book recommendations that I know are coming um, later on in the second half of our class. So with that, um, I'll kick it off to Caleb and our wonderful um, entrepreneurs, Alicia, Beanie, and Tiffany. 
Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, first, just thanks for having me. And uh, thanks to Pooja and Jordan and Eva. They really have been so wonderful to work with. So uh, grateful for the opportunity. And that introduction uh, was obviously uh, overwhelmingly kind. Um, so my name's Caleb. I've been working at La Cocina since 2005. Um, I found the job on Craigslist after working in restaurants starting in the late 90s and moving to San Francisco looking for social justice work. I applied for the executive director job. I'm obviously a, like a ill-conceived candidate for a Latina women's organization uh, and I was rightfully ignored at the time. I uh, offered to volunteer and nobody wrote back to me because nonprofits are under-resourced. And then I ran into the woman they hired to run the kitchen and she offered me the opportunity to open the doors to the kitchen every morning at 6 a.m. starting in the early 2000s, which I uh, said yes to while I worked in restaurants at night. And uh, I have been there ever since. So it has been my great fortune to get to learn about this industry and about um, what it means to do equity work and what it means to pursue economic freedom from uh, some of the most talented and inspiring women in your region, uh, three of whom you're going to get to meet today. And I'm really excited for you. Uh, I really do mean it uh, every time I have said it for 15 years that La Cocina as an organization is irrelevant uh, without the women who make their businesses out of it. Uh, our job is not to show people what to do. Our job is to translate their talents to a broader market that is systematically designed to uh, keep them out of it. And so uh, the power, the talent, the strength, the intelligence, everything that has made La Cocina succeed has come from the hearts and hard work of uh, hundreds of women, uh, three of whom you're going to meet today, and uh, 37 of whom you can read about in La Cocina's cookbook, which is on sale uh, at our uh, <laughs> online uh, store. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to introduce Alicia, uh, Beanie, uh, and Tiffany, I think in that order, because that's more or less the order uh, I met them. And, and they're each going to talk a little bit about their businesses. Uh, and so the first is uh, Alicia uh, Villanueva. And uh, Alicia, I'll let you uh, just tell us a little bit about your business, unless you would prefer for me to do an introduction. Sure. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And thank you so much for having me with you. It's a really big honor to be with all of you. And yeah, my name is Alicia, like I say, and I'm the owner of Alicia Tavales Los Mayas. And like a little small, quick history of my business is like, um, I just arrived to United States in the 2000s. And then with a dream, you know, like everybody with my American dream. And as soon as I arrived to United States, I just start to clean houses and taking care of um, disabled uh, per people. And uh, that was my job, but in, at home, I just was uh, cooking tamales. And then I just go to the street and knocking doors and home people selling my tamales. And that's the way that I started my, my, my business until I get in touch with La Cocina. So La Cocina is, is really uh, helped me a lot in, in touch basis in, in my dream to grow my business. And right now, um, since that time to now, I have a, um, I graduated, I'm sorry, from La Cocina in 2015. And then I moved to Hay where I have my location here and it's a family business. And we have a, 6,000 square feet and we are just, um, I have 20, 21 employees and working hard before we were uh, cooking like 40,000 tamales per month for Chase Center and all the corporations. But um, with this pandemic, we just starting again uh, with the business uh, adapting and make more innovations um, in this situation that we have right now. And um, yeah, it's, it's like um, a little bit of my business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, the next entrepreneur uh, is Beanie. And Beanie, you can let me know. I can give you the introduction or you can easily do it yourself. You want me to do it? OK. Uh, so <laughs> Beanie, uh, can, Beanie, it's uh, appropriate that I do it because it's part of the story here. Uh, now, Beanie came to La Cocina. Uh, because Beanie heard about La Cocina uh, from a chef she had been delivering food to. Uh, Beanie's a domestic violence survivor who started cooking Nepalese food out of her home. Uh, and one of her customers uh, had heard about La Cocina and suggested that she look at La Cocina. So at the time, uh, she and her then infant son, now a Zoom educated son, uh, were driving around San Francisco and the Bay with pints of Nepalese food uh, in their uh, back of their car. What's up? Uh, as a way to make a living uh, and make ends meet. Uh, when she joined La Cocina, 
Uh, she can talk to you a little bit about it. But one of the most striking things about Beanie at that time was that she brought her brother-in-law who spoke on her behalf uh, because of the nervousness around applying and around what it meant to say your dreams out loud or to strive for something. Uh, and now several years later, uh, Beanie is one of San Francisco Chronicle's 100 best restaurants. Uh, she's been uh, featured by Maria Shriver as an example of uh, what women in the workforce can mean. Uh, she's got a brick and mortar restaurant at 6th and Howard, um, and she can tell you more about her employees, uh, but just an incredible example of the kind of uh, flavors and, and stories that our cities are full of, um, and when given opportunity, shine. Welcome, Beanie. Yeah. And Ayush. Yeah, namaste. I'm Beanie, and I'll make it very short because everything they have said, fantastic. Thank you for having me here. I love Berkeley. Um, People, my son wants to go there eventually. He has high GPA. <laughs> we were discussing this morning, and I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you so much for this opportunity for a woman of color. Um, this is this is as you know, the challenge every day is a challenge. But my my main motto is that if you have a challenge, you should try to get in a pool of luck or see that they will make it everything so possible. Because of lack of thing I'm here today, for sure. It's like I had before pandemic, I had 24 people, but it has been very hard. We have closed most of the locations. Uh, now Saturday, Thomas Market is open, and a location in Howard Street is open. It's not easy. Uh, very especially in this time when my son, he does all his activities here, you know, starting from seven in the morning to now. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. And then by the time you go home, you're going up. But it's, it's like, again, start every day. Same way it starts. Uh, but the keeps me going because uh, my employees are my family. Lakasuma is my second home where I grew up with. Uh, there is a saying, I don't know whether there is a saying or not. Once born in Lakasina, it's always, always a Lakasina, you know, participant. So uh, that's how we roll. And, uh, we are still trying to get more business, more people. When we had to lay it off our maximum of the staff employees, it was really hard. It was really hard, and um, we are still trying. And uh, if you are away, if you are here in the city, come over, come to the Thomas Market and have a street try our delicious momos and spread the word about La Cocina. It's like because of La Cocina we are here, and tell them to donate to La Cocina so that way it is like people of color like us, you know, we can be independent and we can help our head high and hopefully we can bring more people and help them as well. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Beanie. You may hear like uh, occasionally an unsolicited uh, advertisement from La Cocina. The only official advertisements from La Cocina are coming from me, like by the book. Uh, all the other ones, I think, are often uh, the humility of the entrepreneurs at La Cocina shining through. And I, they, they force me to reiterate that um, La Cocina's job is to fill gaps in the failure of our infrastructure to deliver equitable opportunity across our economy. And the women who start their businesses at La Cocina, they come to La Cocina with the talent, the drive, and the intelligence to own and run businesses. Uh, it is not our job to, to do that. It, it's their business, it's their success, it's their skill. Uh, what La Cocina's job to do is to make sure that the environment that they walk into uh, is at least uh, as close to the environment than anybody else who's well capitalized or well resourced would walk into. So I just wanna uh, shine that light back on anybody who offers an unsolicited advertisement for La Cocina uh, and just remind everybody on this call that like, you know, change makers, uh, you know, they, they need to be given the space to, to do that um, and to be protected while they do that. And that's, I think what La Cocina does best. And we'll talk about that more. Tiffany, you want me to do it or are you going to do it? You can do it because you're so great with words. Listen, I love it. You know, <laughs> check out the book. It's full of my words. Uh, <laughs> Tiffany, uh, like uh, Alicia and Beanie, all three of the women you're meeting today, I started off in the informal economy. Um, you may or may not have read some of the stuff about La Cocina, but we're rooted in the idea that the informal economy exists because of barriers to entry in the formal economy. So we love an informal economy. We love a tamale at a late night bar or Nepalese food out of a back trunk uh, or like Tiffany's food, a plate of food uh, at a church in the Bayview. Um, Tiffany uh, grew up in the uh, Bayview and other neighborhoods in San Francisco, uh, a one and only San Franciscan. 
uh, went to culinary school, um, tried a couple different careers, and uh, ultimately started selling plates of food out of a church in the Bayview uh, as a way to enter the marketplace. She got a name for herself. I got a small food truck parked out on Third Street. I did that for about a year um, and encountered sort of ha what, what the challenges are for a small business starting up, uh, even in your own neighborhood, uh, and joined La Cocina from there. And earlier, uh, we mentioned La Cocina's Municipal Marketplace, the first all women led food hall in the country. Uh, and Tiffany is one of the, uh, along with Beanie, uh, one of the anchor tenants of that food hall. Uh, so this just this week, uh, Tiffany is on her third day of full service at the marketplace. So, um, you know, if she looks a little tired, it's because she's been serving some of the best food uh, in San Francisco and some of the best social media, in, in my opinion, in the La Cocina community. Uh, and so I'll let Tiffany tell you a little bit about uh, more about who she is and what she's making and what she's doing. Um, hi, everyone. I'm very honored to be here with you guys. Um, yeah, so I, I basically I've always um, been in the food game. I kind of always hustled food even before I knew that it was actually what I was going to do. Um, and then I, I met Caleb after um, having my food trailer <laughs> and it really um, coming to La Cocina really, um, it changed my life, um, changed everything for me because I thought I could run a business by myself and, you know, I, it, it was really, really difficult. Um, but I'm very honored, you know, to have two locations in San Francisco um, as a black woman coming from Bayview, like to actually have two locations. Um, it means a lot. And opening up in the first women-led marketplace in downtown San Francisco, um, and just to be able to to prove that that my concept is um, um, that people do want to purchase from me. I've been able to to take care of myself and my family, you know, from this business. And I think that's something that La Cocina is really great about is providing um, access to market and to sales. You know, where um, before I didn't really have that. So um, it's been a great journey so far. I'm, I'm happy to be on a roller coaster with La Cocina and, and growing my business even through a pandemic. It's been great. So, so Tiffany, thank you. Uh, I might uh, start with a question for you uh, since you've been in San Francisco uh, longer than Alicia, Beanie, or myself. Uh, but I guess I'm, I'm curious, you know, you, you've, you've been in the city, you've seen the city change. I think one of the things we talk about a lot at La Cocina is the last 15 or 20 years of San Francisco has been a story of technological innovation uh, and often uh, success through failure. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit uh, about sort of what it was like to first open your business on your own and, and what were the things that you didn't know or wish you had known um, that you think would have given you a better opportunity in the market? Um, when I first opened my business, for me, it was what I, what I noticed was that um, gentrification in my neighborhood. So a lot of the people that I was looking to support me wasn't there anymore. And a lot of the new people wasn't necessarily looking for, for, you know, what I was cooking necessarily. So those were the kind of challenges that I ran into. And then just the high cost of, of doing business in San Francisco, um, being able to, to get a commercial lease or people to even answer your calls or even take you seriously um, when you're approaching things like that. So those were the things that I um, ran into. Um, it, it was really, really difficult. It was a definitely a learning curve. I, I learned a lot, a lot of things that I didn't think about. Like, wow, my community isn't here. My sister, who I will want to come to my restaurant, is on the bridge um, commuting um, 30, 40 minutes away. She can't come to my restaurant. So it was just um, things like that that really... Um, stood out to me when I was um, starting my business here in San Francisco. Yeah, it changed a lot <laughs> since I've um, grown up here. And Tiffany, I, I, this, is a, all, this was, wasn't a planned question, but you spoke eloquently to it uh, the other day uh, in a panel I saw you on. Uh, but you also talk about some of the expectations for your food and the limitations you felt as a chef when you started out. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so now, I mean, I'm just kind of, I'm owning it. So I, like I proudly serve very unauthentic food <laughs> because, you know, just being as, as a, as a black woman from California, it's like, you know, you're, you're never too, your food has to be Southern, but then you're not Southern enough. Or, you know, I make Creole food, which is New Orleans, but I'm from San Francisco and, you know, and I love making tacos because that's just the California in me. So, you know, it's just like, 
you know, what is authentic? And, and so I've just kind of really just owned um, my food. And to me, it's just, it's just Tiffany, Chef Carter's food. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm a rebel at heart. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Tiffany. Uh, I mean, you know, from lock, from our perspective, from the politics uh, of the bigger moment, I mean, both Tiffany's right in that the economics of small and local business are, re are really difficult. And restaurants for the last 15 years have been used as a vehicle for gentrification and escalating rents in neighborhoods across urban spaces. And the contradiction there is that often the money is in the the, the money that you're pursuing as a small business owner is, is perhaps easier to access or appears easier to access from the waves of new money coming in. Uh, but at the same time, those new waves of money coming in may or may not be looking for your food, prepared to pay for your food, um, or long-term supporters of your food, uh, or who you want to cook for in the first place. And so there's a contradiction in these uh, local economies and thinking about what their impacts are uh, on neighborhoods. And I think to Tiffany's second point, you know, we, we talk a lot about perception and the way people value food and how that's so closely related to identity um, and uh, storytelling. And so being told that your food's not authentic or that you have to do it a certain kind of way or that it should be priced a certain kind of way is obviously, I imagine something you all talked about in class, but was something every single La Cuisine entrepreneur uh, has to think about uh, when they decide what they're gonna charge you for their food because you're signaling to the audience uh, something. And we can talk about that uh, a little bit later. Beanie, I was wondering maybe if you, you might talk a little bit about what it's meant for you to change your business model, to go from selling out of a car to people you knew uh, into where you are now with the brick and mortar space. Right, it was like, it was a day. Like when I, when I, when we, when I was started talking, it took me back two years back where I was started selling from, uh, from a small a family meal pack uh, in $45 to, uh, to a huge number of people where we make maybe about 50,000, 80,000 of momos selling for a day and having from a small uh, Nissan Sentra to multiple outlets is, is amazing. It's nerve wracking. Uh, sometimes even I was like, okay, how did I do that? I'm not saying because I am saying this, but um, a, a big credit really, really from my heart goes to people who work in La Cocina, you know? It's like every minute, every single day, every second, there was somebody for me to, uh, to hold it, you know, to, um, to, to obtain my uh, tears so that I could get on, you know? There were days I still can remember Ayush was not even five years, and he, he was in Caleb's lap, and then he used to carry, and he used to go to Ferry Building to look over because it was hard for me to do things around, you know. Um, so those things from there to this, and having 24 employees who were helping their families back home, and the diversified, not only the police, uh, all uh, in, uh, from Mexico, from uh, India, from Nepal, from China, and all like it, it is one of the um, diversified. San Francisco is diversified, but Beanie's Kitchen is also diversified. You know, having them here, and and then se them sending money, revenue back home, taking care of their families, and the chain was amazing. Um, it was it was a very different ride. It was like a graph up and high, and then again it's down because of the pandemic. Of course, we had to lay off, and this challenge has been very different because we have to survive. Because each one of my employee has families who has to take care. So from Beanie's Kitchen, Nepalese food, despite of Nepalese food, hand grind, whatever I have. The brand is still there, but I'm making American food where I'm making fried chicken and I'm doing barbecue, uh, you know, and and then, sorry, Tiffany, poor boys, and then <laughs> everything, you know, and uh, even Chinese. Um, but I'm grateful uh, even to that instant when I'm doing it, my nine of the employees who are still here, they are still with me. And the challenge becomes intense because these guys were already trained. 
Now, uh, since the, since these guys are not trained, I'm trained culinary wise. Uh, I did my bachelor's from Bombay, so I was I was able to trick myself. But I have to stand here maybe 18 hours, more than 18 hours now, because I want that cornbread to go right. I can't just do cornbread, cornbread, because our our we all are serving to the general American public, and they want American classic meal where we we are making from momos on the side, you know, cornbread, and this is this is huge challenge, um, and that's also. We, we have not let it go. We are going to survive a pandemic and we are doing it. On the side, Caleb keeps getting calls. <laughs> so this is how the graph has gone from down to there. And again, uh, while we are doing this, we have gone to uh, back delivering houses like the way I did earlier and trying to stick to the models and on the side uh, try to survive i, I think what you know, some of what beanie's speaking to is a, a pivot that a lot of small businesses and, and bigger businesses made during the pandemic where they began um serving for programs that deliver meals to food insecure populations throughout the region so tiffany alicia beanie a lot of the entrepreneurs at la cocina have all been uh uh, getting contracts or subcontracts to do large scale meal delivery into their communities and, and other communities. And so obviously th those contracts are not looking necessarily for like hand ground Nepalese uh, spices and dumplings. Uh, they, they might be looking for a more basic cornbread and, and La Cocina's entrepreneurs t tend to be, you know, ready and willing to do that because they've entered this marketplace in pursuit of economic freedom. There's like a really nice story about doing what you love to do. Uh, there's also a real reality that people are really looking for, for freedom. And this is one of the means uh, that's available to them in an economy that doesn't offer a lot of freedom. Uh, and as we can talk about later, you know, like economic freedom might not even be that free, but it's at least as free as we can get in the system that we're uh, living in right now. I think the second thing I want to sort of call out that I think Beanie, talked about is a lot of you put in the answers for like what a business is need you, you put capital which I think is cer certainly correct um, but what Beanie's really talking about when she talks about how wonderful La Cocina is is social capital and the access to a community of people who are going to support you uh, in your enterprises and um, I think for a lot of people who have privilege and social capital and connections you have that built into your network and you don't even think about it if I was going to start a business I could you know, ask a friend of a friend who went to law school to help me draft my legal documents. I could ask a friend who's a graphic designer to do my graphics for me. A lot of that stuff then becomes part of like a barter economy that you only have access to because of your wealth and, and or class. And for entrepreneurs who are new to this uh, country uh, and don't come with that community or who have been shut out of the economy that's not necessarily available. And so La Cocina's role is not just to connect people to existing infrastructure, but to subsidize or to fill in this, the spaces that, that, that aren't there. Um, and I think that, you know, yes, we'll show up and, and you know, do some childcare. We can talk about that later too. Uh, but we're also there to fill in the gaps of the, the little stuff that isn't always in like a business plan, but you're getting uh, consistently when you start your business from, from your social capital. Um, and that, I think that connects to access to markets too. The, the last thing I want to call out from Beanie before I ask Alicia some questions is, you know, the innovation economy that we're very proud of in California, in, in my mind, is like most vibrant in, uh, in, in micro communities, in the informal economy. Uh, you know, Beanie was doing uh, personalized on-demand delivery of, you know, food to people's homes, like long before uh, DoorDash was a billion dollar company. Uh, and Tiffany was doing you know, meals uh, available at a fixed price long before people were on Instagram selling meals and, and plates. And so some of the innovations that our economy gets most excited about are in fact rooted out of the striving, the innovations of people who are shut out of the economy otherwise. Uh, and it's really inspiring to see. And I, you know, that's why one of the reasons I think if you want to know where your economy is going, you, you, you do, you, you need to pay attention to what Beanie's doing, what Tiffany's doing, what's Alicia doing, because they're likely going to do it first. And then I think we have a social obligation to make sure that they then benefit from those innovations, that they don't just uh, innovate and then get squashed by somebody with capital, but instead that, that they get to bask in the glory of their innovation uh, in, in some small way. Uh, Alicia, tell us a little bit, uh, you know, I was hoping you might talk a little bit, most of your team is female, 
Uh, and so I, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about what it was like being a woman uh, selling food and coming into this and being a business owner and, and a boss with a 6,000 square foot factory. You have to come off mute, Alicia. There we go. <laughs> Can you repeat again the, the question, please, Han? Yeah, ta ta you know, a, a lot of your team is, uh, you know, like a women-led team. So I thought yes. maybe you could talk a little bit about what it has been like as a woman, as a mother, um, to start a business. Um, and if you think that that's different because you're a woman, if there are things that have been harder, easier, uh, you know, what it means to you to be a woman business owner and to have a mostly female team. Yeah, it's a, yeah almost all, all my team is female and couple male too <laughs> but uh for me yeah it's, it's like uh Vinny said um it has been really um how can i say a lot of barriers to adapt the business right now um right now i'm serving you uh, uh, i'm serving the students in um, Bacaville district and it's, it's, a, it's like Vinny said, you know, like I have to adapt my menu to the way that they they are looking for. And yeah, and I don't know what to say. It's just adapting the business. <laughs> and Alicia, one of the things that we've talked about, you have you have three children who are, you know, some of them are older now than they were when you started your business. What was it like to start a business with young kids? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, I remember like uh, when I started the, the business, my kids were like eight years old and, and um, just newborn. Now Pablo is as 18 and then pa Pedro is 27. So Pedro is like like the second Alicia in the business. He is just involved in everything, in all the operations, admin, everything, and he helped me a lot. And uh, he's doing the um, deliveries to to everywhere uh, with some help with, with another driver. It is that. And Grecia is uh, right now 16 years old. She is, she was the newborn, and he's the best. Um, how can I say? public relations for the business. He, he, she, if you just go and try to buy some tamales, she sell like maybe five dozens of tamales. She's really, really good in the, in, um, you know, learning and they have a lot of passion and learning with me. And as soon as we are growing the business, everybody's learning. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Alicia. I mean, I think uh, Alicia, Beanie, and Tiffany uh, are all happen to be mothers. Not everybody at La Cucina uh, is a mother. Uh, it's obviously not a prerequisite for starting a business. Um, and I think that some of the structural things that you know we want to and need to talk about ultimately have to do with the way that we value labor, um, both labor inside of our restaurants, uh, the relationship between owners uh, and labor, and the cost of domestic labor, um, and the sort of unpaid fees to uh, mostly women who are doing the work of raising their children, um, which you know certainly plays into the what La Cocina is about and and what you see sort of playing out. And La Cocina has never been able to provide childcare either. So it's an uncomfortable position where we, we're, we're trying to, you know, accommodate uh, business owners who we know are facing barriers to entry and at the same time have to prepare for a marketplace where it's not expected pre-Zoom uh, to have a kid show up in a meeting. Um, and, you know, Zoom has changed that a little bit because we all see the kids and it's part of the glory of it, but it, it's, it's still not an expectation. And it's, it's really hard on business owners, particularly business owners who are expected to be primary yes, children. Uh, Tiffany, Alicia, Beanie, any of you, uh, maybe I thought you could talk uh, or, or tell us what do you think needs to change structurally in the food industry um, for businesses like yours to be able to thrive uh, going into the future? Mm, More access to markets, um, places with foot traffic. Um, yeah, definitely. Like, like I have a kiosk in, this, in the Warriors, me and Alicia. Um, yeah. And Hosting a marketplace. So, like, now I'm just like, I love the kiosk business and I just want more of that type of stuff. Yeah. So, those are great for um, entrepreneurs like myself who don't necessarily um, can afford um, a, a traditional brick and mortar 
So just being really um, innovative in, in how we um, are able to enter the market. I think farmers markets are also um, great. So things like that, um, I think access, is- Yeah, access to stability, revenue generation, you know, for revenue generation. Um, and then market access is very important. And especially uh, this time of the year, it is so difficult, it's so unprecedented. You cannot even uh, plan your next step, you know? It's like you are, like whatever plan I did years back has tremendously changed because of this. So we got to take one step at a time and be open and speak up. That's what I have realized, uh, especially during this time, you ask for help, which as a businesswoman, because struggle is every corner, every step is a struggle to reach out and then speak about your business and then try to get access, whatever, however you want to do. You, you need, you have, you have hundreds of people you can reach out to, you know. I know it's annoying, but it's okay. If it feeds at least 50 people within your employees and their family, it's okay to be annoyed and just... Don't let it go. <laughs> you keep fighting. We gotta go. We gotta do this. If we if we if we manage this year, then we are good. We'll have multiple things coming in, and uh, we just have to take a deep breath and look look over our shoulder and keep going and help each entrepreneur talk about them. Lisa, do you want to add anything? Me, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the, like for example, the banks, the big corporations, um, they have to believe in, in a small business in our, in our business because it's a lot of struggles and barriers that uh, when you go with them and ask for some capital, they give you too much, too much, um, barriers and at the end they don't do nothing for you and we are so blessed that we have some uh, non-profit corporations that they really believe in our business and that's that make that uh, you know that our business um, grow and that the business uh, be success uh, yep <laughs> yeah I mean so you know Lisa is talking about access to capital which a lot of you indicated uh, and there's not often a lot of solutions for it. And at a certain point, businesses need to take on capital. And uh, in order for businesses to really grow at scale, they need to take on significant amounts of risky capital. And if entrepreneurs like Alicia, Beanie, and Tiffany aren't trusted to take big risks, uh, it becomes less and less likely that they're able to see the same kind of rewards that other folks in the industry are. So we talk about that a lot at La Cocina, the, the cost to our entrepreneurs of, of not being able to fail. And that La Cocina, more than anything, is not like a factory for success, but rather like a home for, uh, you know, well-regarded failure. And that if you're going to start your business at La Cocina, we can't promise you that you'll succeed, but we can do everything we can to make sure that if you don't succeed, you still land on your feet. Because if you're an entrepreneur, you are likely to have another idea. Uh, and it could be the marketplace. It could be the timing. It could be anything. And so many of the entrepreneurs that we herald, that's their story, that they didn't, they didn't succeed out of the gate. They needed to learn those lessons on the ground. And uh, low-income entrepreneurs are, are never offered that opportunity. In fact, they're expected to do everything uh, themselves, work you know, 10 times as hard and not fail. And when they do fail, it's, they're pointed, their business plan is pointed to as the reason they didn't fail, when in fact, it's all of these barriers that are stacked up against their business. Yeah. But, and you know, what, what Beanie and, and Tiffany were talking about, you know, Beanie's talking a lot about access to markets. And, and, and I think you've likely looked at some of what's happening to technology and food, but when we think about the future, the third party delivery uh, companies are really taking a huge portion of sales out of the pockets of, of entrepreneurs across the country. Yeah. And it's unclear where that's gonna take us as an economy. And so the kiosk model that's working for entrepreneurs is really being threatened by you know, nameless ghost kitchens, uh, high, call, high percentage, um, almost usurious rates of usership for these companies that all they're doing is capturing data and building a marketplace. And so they're to some extent privatizing these food marketplaces, uh, which means that smaller businesses either need to figure out how to play in that marketplace 
uh, or build their own or find a way for a community to, to say out loud, that's not the kind of food industry, that's not the kind of food we want. And then the last thing that Tiffany was talking, you know, a lot of people ask us about our marketplace and ask about the subsidies that we have that allow us to do the project. And we're highly subsidized uh, in that we have a low rent from the city and we were able to build the space with no debt capital. Uh, one of the things I like to remind people of, though, is that there's not there's there's there are hardly any businesses, particularly large businesses, that don't receive some form of subsidy, uh, whether that's low interest debt capital from a bank that's willing to partner with them, from angel investors who are willing to lose their money, uh, or from city, state, and federal policies that uh, eliminate tax breaks for them. You you don't hear uh, people asking about Uber's subsidies as they grow uh, or the losses that they're able to absorb. Instead, you hear them asking about a small business incubator and the subsidies that they're receiving uh, in order for these businesses to even exist. And, and that conversation reflects like a, a, a sort of inequitable expectations of business owners and how they're going to come to market and how they're going to make that a success, which I think we just have, have internalized and, and don't question enough in the language that we use kind of help replicate some of that. And you see it in uh, the businesses of, of Tiffany and Bean. So that takes us to seven, right? That was where I was supposed to mm -hmm. take you. Yeah. Yep. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, and I'm, I'm getting so many direct messages also about how excited people are. And, and um, we'd like to spend the next couple of minutes just doing a little bit of Q&A. Um, so, so we do have a, a question right in the chat that relates to the point that you just made, Caleb. Um, so I was just wondering if there's anyone out there that's doing deliveries for these types of business businesses without the huge amount of money off the top that um, the traditional delivery players take, or is that a gap in the market? No, I mean, the quick answer is, is yes. And the big companies are understanding that it's a burden on entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs are unwilling to take. So DoorDash has like what's called a white label product uh, in partnership with Toast when they have a flat fee for delivery. So you might see toast, a toast order, and then it goes through and it's a $7 flat fee delivery. That way the customer and the entrepreneur know what that's going to be. I don't know if that's going to work for DoorDash, but that's sort of one of the ways that, that they're answering that question. There, there are like cooperative bike messenger services. If you order from Reams, another La Cocina business, uh, she's working directly with a bike, a cooperatively owned bike messenger service for all of her deliveries. The problem though, then is that she's not listed on the DoorDash marketplace. And so if you go, if, if you come to your food through a platform, uh, the entrepreneur really has to decide how they're going to interact with that platform. Um, and, you know, my big fear, and I, you all probably use these platforms more than I do, so maybe in your small groups you can talk about it, is that that's how people are going to participate in the marketplace, that instead of like Googling tamales, they're going to go to DoorDash and search tamales. And that means that DoorDash controls who shows up on that marketplace entirely because people have signed that agreement. Um, and there's no, you know, anyway, there's just all kinds of dystopian impacts from that. And there are some positive, like I'm happy to talk about the positive economic value of some of that stuff. Um, but I think that's the scary part of it. Do all three, Alicia, Beanie and Tiffany, are you all on delivery platforms? No. Yeah. Yes. I'm I not, I will be now that the, the marketplace is open, but um... I'm hoping La Cocina is able to broker some fantastic deal. <laughs> you all will notice that La Cocina does not have delivery available <laughs> in the marketplace yet because I have been obstinate in our negotiations with these third-party platforms um, to the point where they told me that we probably just have a different worldview, which actually might be like the most honest thing that they said in our conversation. Um, and, and there are, you know, through the pandemic, there have been caps, policy solutions for 15% caps for the platforms, which I think we could probably continue to advocate for at the risk of alienating some venture capital. Um, yeah, fantastic. Definitely a gap in the market for, for anybody that's that's thinking about um, innovation and change making, which is, is a, a focus of our course. Um, so then just, just one last question before break, and this is to, to all four of you, um, which is in, in what ways can people, um, I'm assuming this is coming from students, especially um, support the food entrepreneurs that are women, immigrants, and people of color. And that question comes from Michelle Lee. I'll go. Um, definitely visit our markets. Um, follow us on Instagram. 
And I like people to support me because I make awesome food <laughs> more than anything. Like, so, you know, try it. And if you like it, continue to support and t tell people about it. Yeah, call us in our number and we will deliver no matter what. <laughs> we make amazing food. You'll be licking your fingers. <laughs> yeah. 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 To me, it's the same. <laughs> that call us and we do the delivery and <laughs> we deliver all Bay Area. <laughs> I mean, I, I, we close a lot of La Cocina events by mentioning that you have like three opportunities every day to make very small decisions that can have significant impacts and where you choose to spend your money uh, in a, a capitalist world is like an effective means of deciding what the economy looks like. I also think that we have an obligation to demand the kind of food systems that we want. So when we're involved in systemic decision making to understand that, you know, a full focus on the bottom line is not like a robust economic argument. And it's much healthier to argue for like an economic ecosystem that offers opportunity equitably that pays living wages to everybody. And uh, when you're on a, you know, we had a, we had an, ex, you know, we were at the Berkeley campus for a while uh, in the student union. And that was because we fought for it. And it may or may not work because we're not necessarily gonna to return to Berkeley the best return on their investment for that physical space. They could potentially go to like Subway and probably get paid far more than La Cucina is ever gonna pay them. But students and customers have to demand and say, we, we don't want that. We want an economy that, that feels like us. Um, and you have to, you know, you get a chance to do that almost every day when you decide where your money goes. Um, for uh, Alicia, she's delivering tamale care packages throughout the Bay Area. It's incredibly right. true. Uh, every, every friend of mine who's had a pandemic baby has received a box of uh, frozen tamales, uh, <laughs> quick, quickly followed by a bag of frozen uh, momos from Beanie, who's also doing family meals. Uh, and for anyone who's coming to San Francisco, you can uh, order ahead of time at the marketplace. We'll text you when you're ready, pick it up and go have your socially distanced picnic uh, at City Hall and see what all the Fuss is about. It's a beautiful thing. And I have, I, I'm selling tamales in Berkeley Ball <laughs> in the Monterrey market, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> yeah. I'm also a lot closer in a food box if, if you guys purchase from there. I'm liking there a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, bring us back in Berkeley. We served there for a year. We would love to do that. You know, hot mamas. <laughs> Bring us back. We'll love to see now. We would love, love all to be there. Puja, Eva, and Jordan, please bring us back. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> um, well, well, thank you all so much. Thank you for being generous with your, with your time and, and joining us today. I know we're all, all feeling inspired and hungry um, after, after that session. Um, and, and I think everyone is, is pretty excited to, to check out all your businesses after, after tonight. Um, We'd like to invite every all the students to hop off mute for a, a second and, and just give everyone a big round of applause and express our appreciation. Very, very sincere thanks. Um, we are now going to move to a 10 minute break. Um, Alicia, Benny, and Tiffany, feel free to hop off if you have other commitments. Otherwise, you're welcome to join for the rest of class as well. But for the, the rest of the students, we'll see you back here at 720. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right, welcome back from the break. Let the sound of my voice bring you back to your computer screen. Give everyone a minute to gather around. Perfect, I see faces reappearing. Great to see you all again. Thank you for turning your cameras on. All right, 
Well, without further ado, I'm going to pass it back over to Caleb. And Caleb, invite you to share your screen. Um, all right. Hi, everybody. Let me see if I can do this right. I'm, uh, I'm on parental leaves. I'm a little rusty on my Zoom skills, I was explaining. <laughs> Hopefully you can see that. Cool. Yeah, I can see. Awesome. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about La Cocina. I think it'll be, I mean, hopefully you had a chance to read some of the stuff ahead of time or watch the video. Um, if not, I'll, you can ask some questions. Uh, I'll try to give a ge general background on what it is that we do um, and be available to answer sort of anything you're uh, interested in. Uh, so this is La Cocina. We're a 4,400 square foot shared use commercial kitchen space. We were launched in 2005. And the idea of the organization was that there were economic development organizations doing um, business planning work with low income populations, mostly in the mission. And they found that a lot of people, mostly women, were writing business plans for food businesses and never launching. And when they asked those women why they weren't launching, the answer was lack of affordable commercial kitchen space. So my first lesson there for the stuff that you're thinking about is that La Cocina's success is really built on the fact that we were uh, answering a demand as, a as opposed to trying to find a solution for a problem. Uh, that the informal economy was a community-driven grassroots effort for people to be able to make a living. And La Cocina saw that effort and understood that if we were able, assumed that if we were able to lower barriers to entry, we could move people from the informal economy where they were income patching or making a little bit of money on the side into asset generation, the point where they're able to reinvest in their community uh, higher and grow. And so as you know, you know people, people sell food uh, informally across the world. This is a woman in Stockton, California. There's an enormous Cambodian population there. Uh, and there was a park in Stockton that was really rugged um, for a couple of years, uh, pretty active drug activity. Uh, and the mayor at that time decided to decriminalize street vending in that park. And so it became a place where uh, groups of women would come and sell Cambodian food, which totally transformed the nature of the park itself, because then you have community watchers who have their own livelihood tied up in the success of the park. And so that's an example of a small policy change that decriminalized an activity that people had uh, gone to as a means of self-survival um, in order to change a space. And La Cocina assumes that there's countless spaces like that that we can all be involved in uh, and advocating for. Really, the work that we do is understanding what are the barriers to entry and how can we lower them. So a lot of what we do, I would consider radical. A lot of what we do is really conformist. It's understanding this is the legislation. These are the rules. How can we put entrepreneurs in a position to follow the rules and, and still succeed? So this is a licensed commercial kitchen space, which means that people are legally allowed to produce uh, over $50,000 of revenue from our space. Uh, it's highly subsidized for the entrepreneur, meaning they pay about a third of the market rate to rent space in that shared kitchen. This is obviously a pre-COVID photo with no masks and a lot of activity. Um, and the idea there was that instead of giving people capital, we would lower the artificial cost of entry. So La Cocina doesn't provide any capital to entrepreneurs. We connect them with capital, but what we mostly do is lower the cost of doing business. And just for me personally, we can talk about this later, that has always been my approach, which is that I, I actually, while, while capital, access to capital is an issue, I think that access to opportunity is in fact like a, a, a more difficult problem to solve. Uh, capital, if it has confidence that it will replicate itself, will find its way to your business. Um, what's much harder to do is find really good business opportunities for entrepreneurs, particularly ones who don't have the time or social capital to evaluate the sort of things that are in front of them. You see a lot of restaurant entrepreneurs in particular signing bad leases because they're doing it for survival, not because they're business people. They went into this because it's economic freedom, not because it's their dream to have like a scalable, you know, Momo enterprise. So, you know, La Cocina launched in 2005. We've, we've had a tremendous amount of success. We've had over 60 businesses graduate, meaning they've reached either economic or operational self-sufficiency. Uh, it's women like Veronica Salazar, who started selling uh, tacos out of her home uh, and now has a beautiful restaurant in Marin. Uh, women like Beanie, uh, who uh, started delivering Nepalese food door to door and now has a beautiful restaurant on the corner of Sixth and Market. Uh, women like uh, Reina and her mother, Ophelia, who just opened in downtown Oakland during the pandemic. Uh, Ophelia was selling tamales door to door while she raised Reina in the mission. They were priced out of the mission and moved to Fruitvale where they started selling tamales there too, uh, joined La Cocina 
uh, and just got written up in the San Francisco Chronicle as one of the most exciting new businesses. Uh, and then I just included this quote from Gustavo because it was uh, really lovely about the work that we do and, and we believe it to be true. We felt like we were seen when he said that. Um, and our sort of sense is that we cannot like solve the problem of our economy. In fact, by participating in it, we are probably in lots of ways like perpetuating some of the problems in our economy. Um, but we can like serve as a metaphor for what the world or our economy could be. So, you know, you look at La Cocina and anybody who says that these businesses don't have a chance to assess the marketplace, we are actively disproving that every day. So we are offering an alternative economic model uh, for everybody to look at and try to embrace. And if every city were to invest reasonably in these kinds of small business services and equity of opportunity, you'd have a really different landscape for businesses. That just doesn't, the conditions for that don't exist right now. Uh, this slide is a little bit of a glimpse at all the success our entrepreneurs have had uh, and success in a very public mainstream way. And a lot of that is about perception and the work that La Cocina does is creating a, an umbrella brand. I'm really resistant to being the, the voice and face of La Cocina, uh, despite me currently being the voice and face of La Cocina, because I think it's really easy to talk to me. And uh, part of this work is about entering into discomfort, making sure that the way we have those com these conversations aren't always the expected ways that we have these conversations so that I don't always have to be the translator for these conversations. And so I'm uh, really grateful to Pooja for hearing me uh, on that and including everybody at the beginning of this panel. Uh, and, and then also you know, caveat this like mainstream acceptance of the work in a lot of ways, like that was what I did. Like I uh, took the privilege that I am able to walk through this industry with and tried to uh, distribute it as, as I could. It's redistributive economics for better or worse, you know? So it means that our entrepreneurs are really in this pipeline of prizes and national conversations. Um, and some of that is good and some of that is bad. And that's probably a longer, uh, more nuanced class. But I share it here because you hear nonprofit, you hear incubator kitchen, and sometimes the perception is like these struggling ladies who don't know what to do uh, but the reality is that our economy is shutting out people who otherwise would thrive they would be the best restaurants in america they would be the best restaurants in the bay area and when they're given that opportunity they are or even the best places in the world uh so I, in a little bit of what the barriers to entry are from la cocina this is from an old report from ours but i'm really fucking awful excuse me i'm really awful at making powerpoints and um i'm on my parental leave so i just pulled a slide uh, but essentially, this speaks to sort of like what are the major things that La Cocina tries to address uh, through our program. We, we recruit really heavily in informal micro communities, which 15 years ago in San Francisco, there were quite a few of as 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 people have been priced out of cities, they've been dispersed into, you know, suburban communities, which are much harder to create uh, community in. So you've seen that community move online, like into Instagram marketplaces and sales. So it's just, you know, really something that I think about a lot in terms of where the informal marketplace is heading and how you find those folks who are these sort of natural bone entrepreneurs that are being shut out of the marketplace. But for La Cocina, originally it was it was very much door to door. You know, who is the lady you know who sells tacos from her home? And if you know a working class person, they most likely know somebody who knows somebody. And then if you can enter into those spaces with like humility, uh, you can often uh, have meaningful conversations and understand what people want. And we're really explicit at La Cocina, like not everybody should enter the formal marketplace. There are lots of businesses that are going to be better served in the informal marketplace because it serves their needs better. Uh, so La Cocina is really only for a certain type of business that's ready to move from income patching in, into asset generation. Uh, and these are some of what our entrepreneurs uh, say they face as barriers to entry, uh, access to markets, uh, sexism, you can see that, you know, food business is our predominantly male uh, coming up in a kitchen as a woman is incredibly difficult. The expectations for childcare uh, and parental leave for women uh, in the restaurant industry is dismal. Um, and then the pay gap is enormous, uh, particularly when you add in race. Uh, capital, access to capital, certainly, um, access to markets, you know, for years, really before La Cocina came along, it was incredibly difficult for a business to launch at a farmer's market because they're led by tastemakers and you have to advocate at that level to get somebody into the marketplace. And so one of the first things that we did as an organization was really focus on Alameda Market here in San Francisco. And we launched five businesses there uh, by just sort of relentlessly advocating for them. And then we were able to prove that we could succeed in that model and then we could become a funnel for other businesses. So now, when a new business enters La Cocina, it's usually because we've met them in the informal marketplace where they've written a business plan. We've accepted them and handed them some guidelines for you know, what we think is gonna help them strengthen their product for the marketplace. 
And then once they hit those benchmarks through training that we deliver or that we all do together in a cohort based model, they uh, follow one of the paths that we have established for access to market opportunities. Uh, and often that's something like a farmer's market. Uh, commercial kitchen uh, access, something we provide, permits, and then obviously language. Uh, so we're able to bring down costs, create high value sales, market opportunities, and provide uh, top notch food business consulting training and provide access to capital. Basically, you know, filling in the gap for these business owners who uh, are often doing everything on their own, their books, their social media, their sales, their cooking. Uh, and again, I just want to like, there's lots of debates around organizations like La Cocina, this like teach a person to fish or, or whatever, or feed them fish, however that goes, you know, and I think that those are certainly like fascinating philosophical conversations to have. And I, I find it really hard to believe that there's any successful business that hasn't been handed some fish along the way. Uh, and it's ridiculous to sort of think that the entrepreneurs that we work with don't deserve that too. Um, and just, you know, if you can afford to pay for those fish, it's much easier. And like, I would never do my own bookkeeping for a business I started because I would, I would have access to the capital to do the bookkeeping. Uh, and I think you hear that. I just mentioned that because I think you hear that a lot in the talks about like philanthropy and small business economics and so forth and so on. And I uh, just, uh, as you all go into those careers, I think it's important to be able to, uh, call that out as maybe like a, uh, one way of, of reading economy uh one thing i've been uh you know joking about throughout this is uh, child care but I, I really do believe that some of the most fundamental solutions are policy solutions that are not up to small business owners they could certainly be demanded by uh well-organized small business owners uh, but it's real that you know lack of access to health care child care and affordable housing is crippling our economies and uh, you're going to continue to get income inequality until we can address those as basic human needs, uh, domestic care, um, living wages. And, and while small businesses are engaged in the conversation about living wages, those are ultimately policy, policy decisions that, that cities need to make. Uh, and we need to be active in, in helping them to make it and supporting small businesses to be able to make adjustments so that you can't use small businesses to bludgeon uh, the labor force. Or labor force. <laughs> Obviously, there are other policy uh, moments that I think are worth talking about when you think about labor. Uh, this is Veronica Salazar, and you can read this article a little bit more in the Chronicle if you're interested. Uh, but La Cocina was originally rooted in, in the Mission District. Uh, we started off as about 80% Latino. Right now, about 50% Latino. We don't ask questions about documentation at La Cocina uh, because that's actually a George Bush era policy that nonprofits could be held uh, liable if they knew documentation status. Uh, but anyone uh, with what's called the temporary identification number in California can legally start a business. So every La Cocina business is uh, fully legal, papered up, and, and all of those things. Uh, we talked a little bit about the pandemic, and I just think it's you know silly to not acknowledge that the pandemic is here, uh, continues to have an enormous impact on small business, and makes me really nervous about sort of the future. I'm starting to get some optimism back, and and obviously, anytime you have a crash, there are going to be innovators that come out of it and emerge out of the ashes. Uh, and I think that, uh, as is often the case, and it was is the case for like the mortgage crisis, if you are well capitalized right now, there's probably lots of opportunity, and if you are not well capitalized right now, it's going to be very difficult. So our small businesses have done a lot of pivoting. Um, they've uh, sold community meals, they've um, done our community food boxes, really anything they can to survive. And the goal for small business this year has been to survive in the hopes that 2021 will allow for some growth, but, but it's unlikely. So you're looking at an economic climate where it's demand, lack of demand, that's really going to affect these businesses. Um, and it's going to be hard. You're going to see closures and have to think about what it means to open up opportunity for entrepreneurs as, as, as those businesses close. I share this here just to give you some structural sense of the work that La Cocina does. Um, we had a pathway before the pandemic, three strategic pathways around organizational systems and culture, which is just basically a way of saying, like, don't let your ship fall apart while you're sailing it. Um, our core program, which I think, you know, I can talk about why I think La Cocina has been successful from a business perspective, but I think a, a really strong adherence to your mission statement, a real focus on what it is that you do and uh, trying not to be distracted by solving all of the problems, but making sure that you're really good at solving the one problem you set out to solve. And as we grow, making sure we don't, we don't lose that. And then business services, which is the biggest strategy evolution of La Cocina in the last 15 years. Uh, now that we have as many graduates as we have, 60 businesses, 30 brick and mortar locations throughout the Bay Area, 
there's really not a way to fund a nonprofit to support existing profit generating businesses. And so we need to think about how do we extend our services to businesses like Beanie, Alicia and Tiffany, who are nominally graduates of La Cocina as the economy changes. And the pandemic made that incredibly essential because all the businesses were contracting. So all of a sudden we were talking to uh, 30 different businesses about how, how they could survive as opposed to uh, 60 different businesses about how they could survive as, as opposed to 20 businesses in the midst of, of incubation. Um, sorry, my screen sharing is paused. Is that right? I think it's because I got a phone call maybe. Is that back? Yep, we could, okay. we could see it the whole time. Oh, you can see it, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the sort of pillars that we pivoted to resiliency and regeneration, uh, advocacy and, uh, and education, which, which track with the, path, with the pathways. If we're able through the pandemic to keep businesses from closing, then we will be able to support them in a growth in the future. Uh, if we are able to effectively advocate for the needs of small businesses over the next year, uh, then we may be able to educate in the future about what a new economy should look like. And then obviously organizational stability, La Cocina can't do any of that if we can't pay uh, our staff. So we've done a bunch of different strategies that I think are applicable. Uh, La Cocina raised about a million dollars and distributed it to La Cocina entrepreneurs directly. Um, that was in, in our mind, uh, filling in the gaps for what the local state and federal government were unable to do by making sure that people had the cash they needed to, to live. Making a really hard call early in the pandemic to, to counsel everybody to close their businesses as soon as they could, um, to stop paying rent, to connect them with high level lawyers to protect them from eviction uh, or bankruptcy and to do everything they could to just kind of hunker down and, and wait. And you, you hear it from Beanie and Alicia a lot, how hard that was, not from their business, but, but the emotional weight of having a, a staff and, that you're connected to and a global economy that you're connected to. And the great failure of uh, our region and country in this moment has been that we've expected individuals to solve those problems that are really institutional problems um, by not giving people a social safety net that they could count on uh, and instead forcing small business owners who are often on the margins themselves to cover those costs, which all of the women at La Cocina have done. And so it's the least that La Cocina can do to try to cover some of the personal costs of those women. Uh, we have a community food box, which it sounds like some of you got. I encourage all of you to get it. You can subscribe to it. Uh, and that was a way for us to come up with a kind of new business model to deliver food into the hands of, uh, to deliver money into the hands of our entrepreneurs. Uh, and then obviously we're opening this municipal marketplace. Uh, the marketplace was a pre-pandemic vision. It was a reaction to the way that cities have prioritized the needs of high income earning residents and how real estate developers have used the food hall model as an extractive business model that's nominally supportive of small business, but ultimately has a really high cost per square foot. And so La Cocina's theory was that we could manage a space that would be affordable for, lot, for small business owners, affordable for working class residents of a uh, working class neighborhood in San Francisco, and prove an economic model for other neighborhoods of like what real grassroots ground level economic development uh, looks like and what it costs. Uh, so that opened on Monday. Uh, and that's basically it. I have some other stuff, but I want to leave some room and answer questions. Uh, but that, in a nutshell, is, is what La Cocina does. Uh, we have consulted with organizations across the country and the world. Uh, we've been doing it for 15 years. Um, you should check out our website, read our book, uh, and go support the businesses. Thanks. Thank you, Caleb. Um, we, we do have a lot of questions for you, so thank you for, for making sure to leave time for that. Um, so, so George Kai um, had asked a question in our discussion board about kind of the impacts of, of COVID on the business, which you touched on um, a bit, but could you talk a little bit about some of the pivots that, that La Cocina businesses made or, or that you saw folks making during this time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, basically sales, sales disappeared. So like from March to in June of uh, 2020, you saw like first 100% reduction, then a 70% reduction in sales. And that has basically maintained customers have kind of disappeared and third party platform delivery doesn't really compensate for that for most restaurants. And so, uh, you know, all of these things like corporate catering contracts, school catering contracts uh, went away. And so businesses were forced to sort of rethink how they were gonna get food into the hands of customers and then how they're gonna afford their bills. And, and really the goal for most La Cocina businesses over the last year has been survival. Like how do you not take on debt uh, and, and, and do that? Um, because we as an organization are not huge believers in, in, in debt financing for our businesses because the 
cost of getting that debt back is really high for entrepreneurs because of the runway for business success. And so, you know, rent moratoriums are, are only so helpful because you ultimately owe that rent, which means the assumption is that post pandemic, you're just going to sell, you know, 18 times more than you sold uh, pre pandemic, which is kind of a ridiculous assumption. Um, so, you know, we've seen all kinds of things. We've seen a lot of the food security work. Those contracts have been really important to entrepreneurs, uh, things that happened through the city, state, and federal authorities, uh, and then through philanthropy. That's been a, a huge source of revenue for entrepreneurs. Um, our community food box, which we pivoted to, which was basically a, a way of collecting individual items into a weekly box, selling it with a subscription model. So eliminating risk for entrepreneurs because they don't have to overproduce. Um, and for the first nine months of that product, La Cocina took no percentage. So 100% of the sales were going to La Cocina entrepreneurs. Um, and then everybody else has done something different. You know, Tiffany's been really active on social media selling from Instagram, where I think you see a pretty vibrant economy right now, though, though not, I don't think, a sustainable economy for most small business owners. Um, Beanie has been delivering food to people so you can register for like a weekly family meal for Beanie and she'll drive it to your house. And, and Alicia has pivoted and started selling to school districts, packaged foods, uh, instead of prepared a lot of frozen stuff and, and deliveries. Um, you know, like, like I think Beanie said, for a lot of them, it's like going back to their roots, doing what it, doing what it takes to get food into people's hands because the marketplace has kind of disappeared. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting kind of reversion um, to an earlier time almost. So um, we just had another question come in through the chat that actually echoes a, a, a question that Michelle Lee had as well. Um, so, so what experiences in your life have prepared you for the leadership role you've lived up in at La Cocina. Um, and related to that, how did your background and, and life influence you to join La Cocina? What drove you to want to open those doors at 6am every day? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, um, I grew up in uh, Washington, DC, uh, which, as I hope all of you know, has no voting rights and uh, is like a real ass city in the 80s and 90s. And I started working in restaurants as a teenager. And it only takes like 10 minutes inside of a restaurant to understand that like it is not a meritocracy, like people who are the most talented are not always the ones who own the restaurants and the opportunities are not equitably distributed and you're being paid minimum wage to cook really fancy food for people paying a lot of money. And so, you know, restaurants are these microcosms of inequity. Um, I came from like a social justice family. So I had before wanting to be a cook had always thought that was, you know, like a leave the world better type approach um, was driving me. I was a really mediocre cook uh, and I worked for a really wonderful chef who encouraged me to not be a cook. Um, and so I ended up going to college. And, and honestly, like when I moved to the Bay, I, I was not looking for food work. I was looking for really work in globalization and uh, like race that had been what I was really most interested in. DC is like a very black and white space and I was a public school graduate. So anyone who tells you DC public school doesn't work is lying to you. Um, but uh, I found the job on Craigslist and I, I had been working in restaurants for like 10 years already by then. It's the only thing I knew. And I, I knew I knew how to make restaurants make money. And I wanted a job. I'd had like several really mediocre internships. I was working in restaurants at night, um, making probably more money than I make now waiting tables. Um, but I wanted to do something different. And I knew I knew I could do that work. Um, and I got lucky. But like, you know, for people who are searching for careers, like there's a couple of things I mentioned a lot. Like one is I, I had the I had like the privilege to have a nighttime job and enough cash income coming in to be able to do things during the day that I wanted to do. Not a ton of money. I was like 23 years old, so I didn't have a lot of expenses, but I could wait tables. And then during the day, kind of explore some of this other stuff. And, and I started at the bottom at La Cocina and, you know, I'm, uh, this is my last year at La Cocina. It'll be 16 years for me at this organization. I was supposed to leave at the end of 2020, but, uh, I was asked to stay on by funders. And so like, I'm right back there and I don't know that I'm like willing to start at the bottom of a new thing. Uh, but my own advice to me would be that if you really wanna do that new thing, like you kind of have to, no matter how many degrees or years of experience you have. Um, but what I learned working in restaurants is that people leave so fast. And if you just stick around, you often find yourself in charge, uh, which is what happened for me at La Cocina. And so I, um, 
you know, there's something about perseverance and, and, and hard work and not, not just the vision and, and being willing to learn from other people. Um, I really thought I knew how to do this work at La Cocina. And I, uh, you know, if I look back on how little I knew then, uh, it's pretty shocking. Well, after, after 16 years, what's, what's been your most memorable experience? It's been like such a, I mean, I, I feel so lucky to have gotten to do the job at, at La Cocina. Uh, I see Carla's question, which I know I was supposed to just answer now. I mean, I think, I think the one other thing I would add is that like La Cocina is really built on this like vision of inclusivity and community building. And while we are a food organization, we're also don't consider ourselves to be doing food work. Like we are about economic justice and, and, and equity. And so I, I think of a value system that you're pretty confident in, uh, some humility and being able to learn from the people that you're uh, working with. So not arriving with solutions was really important to La Cocina. And then like, just to be fully transparent, like I am like a generic white dude working in like a world uh, of women of color. And so you need to have some like comfort in being in those spaces and uh, getting people to trust you because there's not a lot of trust in, in those communities for lots of good reasons. Um, and that takes time. So you have to have some patience for that too. And an ability again, you know, for me, like the ethos is anytime somebody offers me something to eat, I'm going to sit down and eat it with them no matter what it is, because that's what it means to be present with somebody. And that's not always, that's not always possible, but you come the closest you can because you want to connect with somebody because that's ultimately what it is that, that you're trying to do in terms of like huge things. I mean, every time we open a restaurant or brick and mortar, it's a revelation. I mean, I worked at La Cocina for six years before we opened a restaurant. Um, and now we have opened close to 40. Um, and it's astounding. I mean, the amount of work that goes into it, the, the amount of personal success that, that people feel when, when they see those spaces is really amazing every time. This marketplace that we opened Monday, I mean, that was a $6 million project uh, that you know we built from the ground up and now it's open and it, it, it could fail. It's gonna bleed money because we're in a pandemic and nobody's going out to eat. And, you know, It's on a really rugged corner that requires significant amounts of security. So that's like a big, scary moment, uh, but you do it and you know, hopefully you don't burn the organization down. And then we did this San Francisco Street Food Festival. You know, a lot, a lot of the stuff that La Cocina did early that I'm most proud of are, are like, when we weren't welcome into a space, we like made our own spaces. So when I couldn't convince farmers markets to carry La Cocina businesses, we decided to like launch a festival and invite people to come to our space. And that really worked. And when we couldn't find media outlets to tell stories about our entrepreneurs that weren't generic and, and condescending, we started like a little media uh, series ourselves called Voices from the Kitchen and, and built a show in a way that we wanted to tell those stories. Um, and I, I'm, I'm always proud of those moments. And I think I learned that from the entrepreneurs. Like you have to do it the way that you know you can do it. And like Tiffany said, make people come back because it's delicious, not just because it's something they think they should want to do. Um, you know, my reason for you all to eat the food of Beanie, Alicia and Tiffany is, is not because of them. Like the, the reason is because of us, because, because of y'all, you know, you, you will get more out of that interaction uh, every time. Um, switching, switching gears a little bit to the, so we talked a lot about the wonderful entrepreneurs, um, switching to the, the funding side, um, obviously I'm, I'm assuming that's a big part of, of what you think about and how do you ensure that there is a steady flow of, of funding. Um, can you speak a little bit to the art of cultivating and sustaining funders? Yeah, I mean, I, um, it's definitely an art. Like I honestly think that waiting tables is the best uh, preparation for that kind of work. Like I think it is service and it's hospitality and you're trying to figure out what your customer wants before they've asked for it. And then you're trying to deliver to them what you think they want in a way that feels like they came up with it in the first place. Um, you know, that's like the really cynical approach, but it's real. Like I am a good, I, I'm a good waiter. I'm a good salesperson. Like they're the two things, you know, um, more structurally, like I, I really do think like a, a really clear and concise mission statement is essential. Like I think it's important to, to come back to that mission statement work and to really mean it, to make sure that it aligns with your values and to not sell anything, to be able to have the luxury, privilege, 
courage to, to not sell things that people want if it doesn't fit inside what you have already said you're going to be good at doing. And with La Cocina that, you know, people want us to be everything. They want us to, you know, they want us to be engaged in organic pipeline work. They want us to be engaged in affordable, healthy food for low-income communities work. I mean, there's too much work and we can't do all of it. And so what we are going to do is we are going to make sure that businesses can succeed in this economic environment um, because of the barriers to entry that they face. And we have values that align with all those other things and we, and we will do the education, but that's gonna have to be somebody else's work. And when you meet with a funder, if they wanna give you a million dollars to do that work, like the answer is no, we, we don't do that work. I, you know, I, I, it, it's not gonna make sense. It's a waste of your money. So that's hard to say, but my experience has been that uh, that clarity of vision uh, brings funders closer to you more often than it loses opportunity. So you end up having them come back two years later and say, okay, you know, we heard you and we've seen your success and you know, here, here's a grant opportunity. Um, so I, I just think that that clarity is really important. I also really believe in like the bulleted pitch. So I think in nonprofits and in small businesses, you know, like objective activity outcome, like goal, objective, activity, outcome. What's your goal? Um, or really what's your objective? What do you hope to achieve? What's the goal that you're gonna measure your success with? Uh, what are the activities that you're going to do to uh, get to that goal? And what are the outcomes that you expect to be able to report on and measure? And if you can answer those four things about the work that you're gonna do, I, I think you have a really compelling argument. And then you just have to find out whether or not funders believe in it. La Cocina has been, been really lucky. Like we've lived this like wave of interest in food. When I started cooking in restaurants, food was like not that cool. For the last 15 years, it's been cool. Like it's, you know, look at this class, it's wild, you know? Um, so that's really helped our, our funding. Um, yeah, I, I love the, that framework that you provided us. And, and um, on, on the topic of, of clarity of vision, uh, my second to last question for you um, is on on what the future holds. So, what 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 does the future for La Cocina look like, and and what's next for you, given that this is your your last year? Yeah, I mean, for La Cocina, I've been there for fifteen years. We were a really small grassroots organization. We are not necessarily a really small grassroots organization anymore, and I think that that for me that has meant that like the somebody else needs to come run the place because like the skill set that it's required to run the place effectively is not the skill set that I've brought to the table for the last 15 years. And so my hope is that if La Cocina is able to continue doing what we've done for the last 15 years, it would be tremendously successful. Like I think that that would be something to be really proud of. I also think there's ways to structure and formalize some of the stuff that we've done on the fly and make La Cocina a more sustainable place. Um, and so We've set out some strategies that really do look at earned income. We've always generated a lot of our earned income. The pandemic really messed that up, but we've, we've had revenue streams that La Cocina has been entrepreneurial about that has allowed us to rely on foundation funding less than other organizations have had to. We've generated about 60% of our operating costs through earned income stream. And we have these, this product, the, entre the graduates, that uh, is excellent and has needs. And are there services that we can sell to those graduates that will fund the work that we wanna do for our pipeline and kind of make a little circle of success? So that as our businesses grow, the return to the organization grows, as that return to the organization grows, we serve new pipeline businesses better. Um, and so you see some of the seeds of that work in our marketplace where we're managing a space in our community food box where we're managing a, a product and then ultimately thinking about, you know, what does a, a cooperative restaurant group structure look like? Are there other assets that we can provide to entrepreneurs um, that will help, that will pay us basically to do more of the work that we've been doing? Awesome. And, and final question. Um, because I promised you a plug. Um, are there any TV shows that you'd recommend that we watch? Yeah, I mean, uh, we were just talking earlier while you all were in the waiting room and I'm an enormous fan of this show, Queen Sugar, which I think if uh, you're in this class, you should watch. And it's on season five and I think it's the best food related show I've ever seen. Uh, and it's about uh, land and farming and race and class and all kinds of things in Louisiana. And I highly recommend it. It's in season five right now. And season five is like a COVID season, but you should start season one. Wonderful. Well, well, all those topics, as you mentioned, are super relevant to our class. So, so definitely a recommendation that hopefully a lot of the students will take. Um, 
And with that, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, I, again, want to invite everyone to hop off mute and, and show Caleb how much we appreciate him, him joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Um, so I think Eva and I are going to wrap up with the last couple of minutes of class here. Um, that was amazing. I am craving tamales so badly. <laughs> All I can think about right now is <laughs> placing an order for that care package. Um, but that was that was incredible. And we wanted to take some time, some of the feedback mid-semester was to kind of capture some key takeaways at the end. Um, so Pooja and I will share some of our key insights. And do you wanna kick us off? Sure thing. Um, so apologies in advance, we won't be as eloquent as Will normally is. Um, but uh, one of the things that that's really stuck with me um, throughout this conversation is thinking about the importance of social capital in addition to financial capital and, and the significance of those networks and um, essentially forms of privilege that we many of us have, but don't realize or don't, don't think about as, as concrete privileges. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And that, I, the way that Caleb phrased this, this recognition of restaurants as a microcosm of inequity and I think just going in depth and really understanding the barriers that culinary entrepreneurs are facing that as he phrased it, shut out people who otherwise would thrive. Um, and then I think taking that a step further to, well, what can we do? What role can we all play to support? I think visiting the first woman led marketplace in San Francisco and choosing to you know, spend our money, tell our networks and following on social media, showing that support. Those are all active steps that, that we can each take. Yeah, and, and like, like Caleb said right towards the end, just having the uncomfortable conversations and being willing to go out of your comfort zone and, and show up to do that work. Um, and uh, that, that kind of makes me think of another um, point that was mentioned that I, I really, found profound, um, which is thinking about how in Silicon Valley, there's all this emphasis on failing, on failing fast, moving fast, breaking things, et cetera, but that space isn't given um, to everyone. And so the, the fact that La Cocina is able to give entrepreneurs the room and opportunity to take risks and, and fail um, is a really interesting way of framing their mission and, and the work that they're doing. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Pooja, again, for all of your work coordinating and facilitating tonight. And Caleb, huge thank you. This was such a special night. And I'll close us out with just a quick reminder on what's to come. So tonight's submission was the last homework, weekly homework submission for the semester. So next step is working on the final paper. And the deadline for that is May 12th. So get started on that. And in the next few weeks, know that I'm here, Will's here, a teaching team is available and eager and open to be sounding boards for you as you start that work. So please do reach out, visit us during office hours and thank you all for a great night. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Eva? Eva?